Disgraced movie producer Harvey Weinstein will face a new trial sometime after Labor Day weekend. Last week, the highest court in New York overturned a 2020 rape conviction against the former movie mogul. It said the trial judge had made a mistake and should not have allowed testimony from women who made allegations for which Weinstein was not charged. Weinstein remains behind bars because of another rape conviction in Los Angeles in 2022. The New York conviction was seen as a landmark moment in the Me Too movement, which has led to a reckoning of sexual misconduct and abuse by powerful figures in the United States and beyond. But the founder of the Me Too movement says that she does not see this as a setback. Toronto Burke coined the phrase Me Too back in 2006 before it caught on as a movement in 2017 in the U.S. and around the world. She now joins me. Toronto, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So as I said, it has, uh, it's just been over a week now since Harvey Weinstein's rape conviction was overturned in a New York court. When you heard the court's decision, what went through your mind? Well, I was disappointed, like I think many survivors were around the world. You know, it was really disappointing to see a reversal in what, as you said, was a really landmark decision. You said last week that this wasn't a blow to the Me Too movement. Explain that for me uh, and, and why you are not looking at this as a setback. Well, because it would be really um, foolish, I think, for anybody to think that an entire movement can be predicated on one case. Hmm. You know, there is there, there have been many, many um, strides made over the last six and a half years. So many different laws have been passed. Policies have been changed. Other decisions have been made, and culture that has been fundamentally shifted um, in many different ways since Me Too went viral. So to have one singular decision be reversed and a new trial set in, in that um, and say that it's a blow, it's a disappointment, yes, but a blow, I think, is overblown. Hmm. Um, yeah, it, it wouldn't be sustainable for us to predicate our entire strategy and moving our movement forward on a singular case. Weinstein was kind of the, the, the beginning of this movement, though. Talk a little sure. bit about, about that and, 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 you know, at the, at the time, how this all started. And I think that's probably where the biggest problem lies. The fact that we, I understand that, that it was popularized around um, the Weinstein case, but the fact that we don't look at the what, what really popular, popularized Me Too were the people who said Me Too, mm. right? The ability for people to come forward and bear their souls and say that this happened to Me Too is what popularized Me Too. The Weinstein case was what elevated the voices of many very famous people to come forward and say, you know, say, and that laid the groundwork and the foundation for everyday people to come forward and say, me too. And so this is the same sort of formula. When a very famous person has something happen to them, the whole world has to stop and the whole world has to judge everything by the infamy or the, you know, the, um, the popularity of that singular person. But when you think about 12 million people in the course of 24 hours who came forward and actually said me too, that's what moves this and propels this movement forward, the survivors. And we still have millions and millions of people whose lives were impacted and are impacted by sexual violence. And that's where we're focused. Were, were you surprised yourself at how many people spoke out? No, <laughs> because I know the, the breadth and depth of sexual violence and how it impacts people's lives. I was surprised that people um, had the were, were had the um, opportunity to say it publicly. I was surprised that we finally had a moment in this country or in this world, I should say, to to actually stop and listen to survivors. That was surprising that people were listening for once to the voices of survivors. That was absolutely surprising. But the number did not surprise me. I mean, in the United States alone, it happens every 68 seconds. So no, it's not surprising. Every 68 seconds, that's a shocking statistic. Yeah. 
Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, it, it, Rowena Chu, one of uh, Harvey Weinstein's alleged victims, told the BBC last week that this could discourage other survivors of sexual assault from coming forward. Uh, do you see the court's decision as further harming that faith that survivors have in the justice system? I can understand why some people feel that way, but I, I would offer something different. I would offer a, an alternative perspective. I think people need to remember exactly who Harvey Weinstein was. This is one of the most powerful men in entertainment, one of the most powerful men in business. And so every step of the way of bringing somebody like Harvey Weinstein to account for his crimes is a humongous victory. Having him see have a day in court alone is a humongous victory. Having him be uh, convicted as a humongous victory. Having these women have the ability to stand up in court and testify and have him to look him in his face and tell him directly and say directly what was done to him is a humongous victory. And so there are millions and millions of survivors who will never, ever, ever see the, the perpetrators of their crimes in court. They will never have moments like that. They will never have days like that. And we have to understand that these are victories. So survivors should never be discouraged because most of us won't find the accountability or the justice we seek in courtrooms. And so every time there's a moment like that, even we even get close to that, we have to count all of that towards victory. Accountability looks different for everybody. Justice looks different for everybody. And so survivors should not be afraid to come forward because every piece of that puzzle counts. You have said that the movement shouldn't be measured on whether or not, uh, you know, a specific famous uh, man is convicted or not, but by focusing, as you said, on the well-being of survivors. By that metric, then, where does the movement stand today? I think you have to look, again, at how much progress has been made over the last six and a half, almost seven years. There, again, have been numerous laws changed, numerous policies changed. But... Also, beyond the laws and policies, you have survivors who thought that they were going to go to their grave with these stories buried in the pits of their stomach, who now can walk around with their heads held high, can walk around with their spirits and their souls clenched just because they were able to free themselves from these stories that held them hostage. Those are victories that a lot of us don't count, and those counts matter. People's lives have changed because they've been able to free themselves from the shackles of their stories. That's important. We want to change the laws and policies and the culture so that sexual violence doesn't happen. Our ultimate goal is to find solutions to end sexual violence. Sexual violence is solvable, and we don't ever talk about it like that. We think about it as a foregone conclusion. And now we have a movement to, to move towards that end. That's what we need to be thinking about, not these whack-a-mole individual cases, because these individual cases, when you line them all up, still won't find us a solution to end sexual violence. And that's our goal, to get to a place where people are not saying me too. So, you know, the, the culture has significantly changed since this movement started. How much further do we have to go as a society, though? A very, very, very long way, yeah. which is why we can't go case by case. We have a very long way to go. So, you know, there's so much work to be done, and there's, there, there's a, a very broad spectrum that's, consi of, um, that's considered sexual violence. What we're talking about in the individual, individual case of Harvey Weinstein is just one piece of that puzzle. And, we, and if we just continue to focus on one piece of the puzzle, we're missing a wide, wide spectrum of, of activities that we never get to talk about. And also, I should add, a wide spectrum of people that we never get to talk about. In Canada, you know, we should be talking about the indigenous people in Canada mm -hmm. who deal with sexual violence. That is a huge problem in Canada. So while we're having interviews about American rich white men in America, we should be having interviews about the indigenous population in Canada and the problems that are happening there. So I think when we keep recycling the same stories, that's what leads to a problem it, and, and, you know, that leads to a problem where we're not getting to the heart and root of this issue. Hmm. Toronto Burke, appreciate your time this evening here on Canada Tonight. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.